Natalie Haynes is at it again. This time, she's taking on Medusa and bringing a fresh perspective to the infamous Gorgon. Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You're listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today's podcast is with Natalie Haynes, who's the author of several books, including A Thousand Ships, which was a national bestseller and shortlisted for the 2020 Women's Prize for Fiction. Natalie is also a comedian, and her humor and wit infuse all that she does, as well as a broadcaster for the BBC. She has written for The Times, The Independent, The Guardian, The Observer, and today we will talk about her newest book, Stone Blind. But before we begin, a quick thank you to our Classical Wisdom Society members who make this podcast possible. If you would like to become a society member and help support the classics, as well as enjoy our free newsletter, go to classicalwisdom.substack.com and sign up. Now, on to Medusa. The story of Medusa is just a fantastic one. Um, and it is captivated for thousands of years, you know, the beautiful woman turned into a monster. And uh, it, it really is just one that everybody wants to know more about, both for the good and the bad. But why do you think this myth has permeated our culture so much? And why do we need to revisit it? I mean, at the most basic level, I think it's a, a myth that shows male fear of the female gaze. Um, it's This is all about what happens when women look um, and what the consequences of that could be. And so... I think there's a really interesting way that people look at Medusa in a way they don't look at, for example, Midas. So essentially they have the same ability, which is to turn an animate object into an inanimate object. Midas obviously turns things to gold by touch. Medusa can turn turn things to stone by sight. And yet routinely what we do is when we see dramatizations of this story, when we read them, um, we see... Medusa's story from the outside and Midas is from the inside. So we go, oh, what would it be like if everything I touched turned to gold? That'd be awful. How would I eat? How would I drink? We imagine the experience internally. When we look at Medusa, we say, oh, how would I stop Medusa turning me to stone? And it's like, "Mm, I've got a question. (laughs) And my question is, what's just happened there? And so I was really interested to look at her story from the inside because I felt like so often when she was considered she was considered from this sort of external observer standpoint because we're afraid of, of what she can do. Um, and I thought, that I, I researched her quite heavily for Pandora's Jar. There's a chapter on, a nonfiction chapter on her in Pandora's Jar. And it was really interesting starting to kind of hunt round her story that firstly, that Gorgons aren't particularly deemed monstrous in the ancient world in the way that they are in the in the modern world. Secondly, that there are more, more than one of them you know, the, 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 sort of the standout version of Medusa, I reckon, is the Ray Harryhausen version from Clash of the Titans in 1981. And there, you know, she's coded heavily as a monster. She lives in a cave. She's on her own. She's got a snake for a tail. She's got a bow and arrow. She's a hunter being hunted. Um, and that's quite a long way from, from our Greek sources where, you know, you see her as one of three sisters. As you say, that she is somebody who doesn't start her life as a monster, but is literally monstered she's rendered a monster having survived a rape um and so i think she there's something in her story sort of for all of us she is a it's a um it's a really important story of um surviving assault uh, the first assault i suppose i should say um because for sure she doesn't survive the second um but it, there's a, a profoundly intense sister story in there too i think although that's that's largely been forgotten Um, But yeah, I think the reason that she's so, she's such a iconic image um, and used everywhere in the ancient world in the same, Gorgonea, particularly Gorgon heads um, are used across the ancient world as, you know, they put them on doorways, they put them on temples, they appear as anti-fixes at the end of pipes, and that runs right the way through to, you know, Versace's logo now. So there is something about that round face with the sort of radial design, which is either snakes or hair, or if you're drawing a sun, then sun's rays or whatever, that appears in multiple cultures. So I think that, that that's, there's a very tempting um, accessibility to Medusa's story um, in its visual terms. And most of our sources for her are visual. We don't have that much literary evidence about her, really. 
So you, you, you mentioned many times like her being a monster. And I think this is a really interesting element of the story because you're seeing it from, from her perspective. But it does bring up the question uh, that what is a monster in the first place? And, and yeah. the corollary is what is a hero? Yeah, I mean, I'm I I have a different answer to both of those questions. I imagine from most people, um, I think being a monster is about what you do and not what you look like, um, and uh, that's obviously not the case in in Greek art, particularly in the fifth century, where Greek art undergoes this sort of huge beautification project, and the monsters become lovelier and lovelier <laughs> until eventually the sirens are just really pretty bird ladies, <laughs> and you go, yeah, why not? Um, and so I don't share that it's very rare for me to go out on a limb from fifth century Greece but I don't share that opinion I think you you can't know somebody as monstrous by their appearance you have to judge them by their deeds um and that is if anything equally perhaps even truer um on the notion of heroes and I'm always a bit more ambivalent about the word hero because of course we often use it to mean protagonist rather than person who is heroic um and that's certainly um I mean, to be fair, that's not even true. That's not true either way for Perseus, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Perseus is the protagonist in Ovid's Metamorphoses, the bit where that the Perseus and Medusa story appears there. But he most certainly isn't in terms of the quantity of representations, which seem to make it pretty clear that Gorgonea, the Gorgon heads, existed first. And then we start to get Gorgons with full bodies, almost as though those inveterate storytelling Greeks saw their strange, grotesque faces around and decided to attach bodies to them to give them a sort of strange body with wings, um, usually, uh, although not a snaky tail, Parquet Ray Harryhausen. Um, and, uh, and so then I think they need a reason to separate the bodies from the heads. And that's when Perseus enters the story. So it's not actually a story of a hero who needs a monster to overcome which is a, a narrative structure we're all quite used to. It's the other way around. It's a, a strange creature who, who needs to be, for the purposes of being able to make sense of the art around you, um, separated from her head. So Perseus is quite, is quite late into the story. Um, and my version of him isn't particularly heroic because I think there is a tension in the way Perseus is depicted in our ancient sources and particularly in vase paintings. There's an incredible vase in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, which shows, Perseus in, in the act of killing Medusa. And when I say that, I mean, his sword is literally curving. It's a, a curved blade, a harpe is the word in Greek, curving around her neck. So he's sort of caught in the act of killing her. And, and you see that he's, he's just, he's covered in endorsements from other gods. You know, it's practically branding. He's borrowed Hermes shoes, which obviously give him the ability to, the, their wing sandals so he can fly away from the scene of the crime. He's wearing a hat, which, you know, it could be Hermes hat, but in our literary sources, he's at this point wearing the cap of darkness that belongs to Hades, i.e. a hat that makes him invisible. Um, the sword is Zeus's, uh, Zeus's harpe. Um, he's looking behind him at Athene and she's offering him advice. And you can look at that scene two ways, either one, here's a demigod um, with all these other gods helping him out, a son of Zeus being aided by a daughter of Zeus and all these different pieces of, uh, of quest um, furniture supplied by all these different gods. But another way of looking at him is to say, just how helpless is he, this hero, that all these gods have to contribute to his quest. If you look at Heracles, Hercules on vase paintings, he doesn't look anywhere near as well assisted by multiple gods. So I think that tension of, of Perseus as both the son of Zeus, but rather a helpless demigod or hero as they go, is right there from, from fifth century or even sixth century art onwards. Yeah, so it's funny that Perseus is, I mean, you definitely depict him as kind of a, a brat. <laughs> he is a brat, yeah, he is, I'm afraid, yeah. But it's, it's also interesting that you're saying about, you know, the Gorgon is a head and a power existed long before Perseus, and mm -hmm. she has also lived further on. I mean, Perseus is not really a household name in the same way Medusa is. And mm. I know there's kind of that, that thought that in many ways, Medusa's full potency, you know, happens when her head is severed, that she becomes this, you know, cult object. Uh, it almost makes you wonder that like her power and influence kind of begins with her tragedy. But I wonder like in a 
ancient Greek culture where like Cleos is like your reputation and what people mm. say about you is the most important. Didn't Medusa win? I mean, don't we know her much more than yeah. Perseus? I mean, it's a valid point. It's a shame you have to die to win. It's not my favorite way of winning. Um, but I mean, that's a choice that Achilles makes in the Iliad, isn't it? That he he literally chooses Cleos and a short life over a long life and no fame at all. Although, of course, it's a, a decision he seems to regret in the Odyssey when Odysseus sees him in the underworld and he says he'd rather be, you know, a, a poor man working the land than king among the dead. So that that Cleos seeking mindset seems to be undermined in, in the Odyssey, even though it's so integral to the Iliad. But yeah, of course, it's it's the case that Medusa has had an incredibly long and um, and illustrative career. You know, we see her in sculpture, we see her um, in vase paintings, we see her. You know, there's there's in the Iliad, Agamemnon has her painted on his shield. So Gorgonea appear um, in in all these different locations, and they seem to be operating a sort of dual function of both scaring the enemy, but also protecting the the person who has it. I think that's why you have them in doorways. There's a, a reason to have them in this liminal space. Is it to scare away burglars or to keep the people who live in the house safe? Both, surely. And I think the same is true when you paint one on a shield. It's like, you're gonna scare your enemy. You've painted something scary on a shield, but also there's a reason why we use the word shield to mean protect as a verb, you know? It's like, well, that that's the thing that's looking after you and your gorgon head on your shield maybe is is an important part of that i'm minded of the um story that when asclepius is learning his um healing powers uh the goddess athene gives him two drops of medusa's blood one from the left hand side of her body one from the right hand side of the body and i think the left hand one is um lethal it can kill anyone de deadly poison the drop from the right hand side is soterian it can revive you from the dead so she has this dual quality right from the get-go you know the the downside to the way that her image has multiplied is that it's also been simplified so it's just like oh monster head um i think she probably is the most famous monster to come to us in terms of visual recognition i reckon she'd probably win out over the sphinx maybe a centaur might edge it i'm not sure um perhaps harry potter has pushed centaurs more into public view i'm not sure uh but I, I mean, she's got a good case, I think, to be the most recognizable, the most easily recognizable um, monster to come to us from Greek myth. And yet, you know, she isn't. She isn't a monster. She has this dual function. And her, her name, Medusa in Greek, literally means guardian or, or one who watches. So, yeah, maybe, maybe she's a monster, but it seems much more, it seems much closer to the way she was conceived that she is this sort of dual figure that can both scare and protect yeah and it's amazing that like out of her death you know i mean for all mortals we're going to die but out of her death you know she creates pegasus and the atlas mountains and corals in the red sea i mean she is like this life-giving force in a way but also the duality in a way of her relationship with athena because obviously athena is this horribly petty vengeful goddess that curses her but then by putting her on her shield, does she then immortalize her? Aegis, immortalize her? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly true. If you look at images of, of Athene, she really often has uh, Gorgonae on, um, on her aegis, her breastplate. Um, so yes, the connection between them isn't, isn't one I had to invent for this book. It was one that was already well in place. But uh, yeah, I can't talk too much about the um, Athene Medusa um, coming together because I'd save it till the end of the book and I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, and I, I I think that's good because yes, it's it's. Uh, but in your book, it is very interesting that Medusa is sort of one of many plot lines. Um, yes, which I think is really interesting for me. I really enjoyed that because it sort of interweaved all these different tales, and because it's hard to understand one part of mythology without having at least some background in the other. So in a way, I I felt it was you know important to kind of weave all of those but were there kind of lessons to be found in some of the other plot lines and maybe give the readers a, a little bit of a, a listeners a bit of a taste about which other major characters are are in the book well I I mean I borrowed them from across her whole myth that's why the book is called Stone Blind and not Medusa um, because I didn't think it should focus just on one person um or on one character because there are so many women in her story and so 
Um, there are obviously lots of women in the life of Perseus um, who help him uh, on his way. Some of them more willingly than others has got to be admitted. So Danae, his mother, who's famously impregnated by Zeus after he's taken on the form of a shower of gold, um, and she's locked in a you know an impenetrable cell, uh, but he manages to literally and then literally penetrate. Um, and so you have the story of of her, which needs, and it's like, could you do it without? Yeah, I suppose so. But I'm not interested in looking at Perseus's story from Perseus's perspective because that's been done countless times before and it's simply, it, it, we don't need another. When someone does it really well, I'll read it, but I'm not gonna write it because I'm, I just don't see the need. And so the, there are multiple female characters who help him along his way from the Graii, the um, gray ladies of the sea, um, who share a single eye and a single tooth to the Hesperides, the nymphs who live in the, um, the Garden of the Hesperides, guarding Hera's golden apple tree and so on. And so it's like, well, let's look at his interactions. Let's only see Perseus through his interactions with all these different female characters, because for literally thousands of years, we've been asked to see women in those terms, to only see them as they um, you know, occasionally, tangentially touch on the lives of men. It's like, well, okay. What happens if you if what happens if you spin that round? And the answer is, you find loads of amazing female characters, and they fill up the space really well. So it, it's just fine. I'd done it. Um, I'd done a polyphonic novel before with um, a thousand ships, which again took the the sort of central core of the story, which was the Trojan War, um, and then followed its causation timeline backwards and its consequences timeline forwards, but only framed through the female characters who who contributed to it. And it turned out you could tell the entire story of the war with, with no you know, omissions by only focusing on the female characters. It wasn't, it wasn't difficult at all. If anything, I had to ditch female characters because the book was already you know, 90,000 words long. And so with this one, you know, there, were, there were so many female characters to include. Again, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't difficult at all to, to take the story that way. And I felt that then you would have the story of Medusa given a context because what happens when she becomes the monster that Perseus kills is that she's robbed of that context. She's robbed of her role as daughter, as sister, um, and, you know, and, and many more parts of her character just get, you know, forgotten or, or dropped by the wayside. I don't think it's a sort of um, an evil misogynistic plot to dehumanize her. It just does happen if you center all your attention on someone else. Now, in we've talked about this before about how laughable the question is: what's the real version of a myth? You know that yes, because there are always so many. Um, yeah, and and sometimes people think, well, is it the earlier one or is it a later one? And you were just mentioning before about the sort of beautification of mm. the monsters in the sort of fifth century, um, and that the original version she was originally a monster. That the sort of the rape and the assault were were sort of more later, you know. When, when I mean, they're really her. early. They are really, really early. As soon as as soon as there's narrative about gorgons, i.e., as soon as they stop just being decorative heads, okay. or strangely decorative heads, but decorative even so, then it comes in pretty early. We've got sources from Hesiod, who's you know contemporaneous with Homer, um, roughly in uh, the Odyssey when Odysseus goes down to the underworld. He gets the fear when he realizes he might Persephone might set the Gorgon's head on him, and so he he leaves swiftly because of that. So the notion of her being separated from her head goes back a long way. I mean, you know, Homer and Hesiod is eighth, seventh century BCE. So and Pindar is you know early fifth. So we've got really early sources for her. Um, so yeah, I think the. That what's interesting about the way she's depicted is that you can 100% of the time, if you look at a vase um, or a sculpture of her, the, the more monstrous it looks, the earlier it is. You can pretty well always date them um, just from a glance because she gets, I found an incredible image of one the other day, a Hellenistic one. And she looks like she's been, she looks like she's come from Jane Austen. You know, she's, <laughs> her snakes are so beautiful. They're sort of curling around her as beautiful ringlets. Um, absolutely extraordinary. And, and that's sort of probably second or first century BCE. So really late. And by that point, you know, the, the but uh, right as, as early as Pindar, we're told she's Uparu, she's got beautiful cheeks. In Ovid, writing at the end of the first century BC into the first century CE, he says um, that she was Clarissima Forma. She had this incredibly beautiful form. And suitors came across the world, he says, to, 
to try and marry her before she's cursed. And it's like, well, there is only one other story I can think of off the top of my head where suitors come from all over the Greek world to bid for a single person's hand in marriage. And that's Helen of Sparta, who'll go on to be Helen of Troy. So, you know, there, there is this suggestion really quite early on that she's that she is beautiful. As I say, Pindar has her as beautiful. Um, but visual arts just, um, I don't know, they sort of have their own timeline a bit, I think. So the the things that look beautiful, I mean, it's a, it's a question that comes up in, within the book um, and one that Medusa finds easier to answer in some ways, I think, than I do, which is always a bit irritating when that happens. Um, she's really sure what, what is beauty and what isn't. Um, I find myself slightly um, less co convinced of her answer than she is, but it's a good enough, it's a good answer, you know, and as far as Medusa is concerned, the act of, of caring, the act of loving is what makes someone beautiful. And, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I wouldn't die on the hill of arguing against that. It's like, well, yeah, why not? No, and I love that the sisters are sort of depicted in this very caring and loving way and, and that mm -hmm. the, their interaction becomes the focus. And, um, and in some ways you wonder that when she's sort of made into a monster, she's more like her sisters. That they love that happening. Yeah, I, yeah, I feel really bad about it because I would like, I would like her to feel like Uriali wants her to feel. And, and at the same time, I know that she can't, just as Uriali does. But it's like, you know, you could relish this power, but you can't because it came to you the wrong way. And, you know, that right there is the, is the problem, I suppose. So, yeah, no, there is. I really enjoyed writing about sisters. I've done it less than I would like to have done, I think, in the past. I wrote in The Children of Jocasta, obviously, there's a sisterly relationship, but they're very, very distant in, uh, in Jocasta. Antigone and Ismene are really operating in completely different moral universes, let's say. Uh, the way I conceive them. Um, but doing, getting to write Three Sisters, it's really interesting when people first started interviewing me about this book, they kept asking me about this kind of maternal bond. And it's like, it really is sororial, <laughs> I promise you. Um, and I, it, it feels lovely to me to be able to write it because although I don't have sisters, I am a sister. Um, and so I really like being able to, to, to have that, you know, generally when you get sibling narratives, it, it tends to be sort of rivalry, you know, and it's like, well, but what, but what happens if, what happens if you have these two, uh, this is from Hesiod when he mentions them in the Theogony, he says there are three Gorgons and these are their names and th these two are immortal and Medusa is mortal and he just kind of throws it away, that's a wretched fate, he says, and then he moves straight on. And I really thought when I started writing the book that that kind of tension between being mortal and immortal would be something that plagued these, these three sisters and it became clear within the, about four pages of, of, of the start, that first sequence where they meet her that, that that it would be you know there was no way this would come up that was far too it was typical me it was far too abstract a concept to actually concern people as they go about their daily lives of loving someone and trying to look after them so I was like oh yeah no that's not yeah mm -mm, there we go <laughs> so it was something that fell away almost immediately because it became really clear really quickly that actually the thing that would matter to you most about your sister being mortal when you are immortal, when you first find her, would be that she changes. Because, you know, the sort of, the corollary of being immortal is that you're unchanging. And the joy of writing Athene or writing any of the gods in um, uh, A Thousand Ships before, but especially writing Athene and, and Hephaestus, um, Hermes, Zeus, Hera in this one, is that, that they don't learn anything they've got no interest in learning anything because why on earth would they you know that what could they possibly need to know um and so that kind of inability to communicate with perseus in the case of of athene and hermes as well to a slightly lesser extent the joy of it is that it's like you kind of have to start from the position of saying well how would i have a conversation with an ant you know how would i explain to an ant that it's doing things wrong it's like well i wouldn't care i would just well, I wouldn't, I'm vegetarian, but a person might not care. They would just tread on it. And you'd be like, oh, oh. and then here's, here they are trying to interact with somebody whose opinion they're supposed to vaguely care about. Of course, they're not going to. They'll do what they're told. They don't really care one way or another. It's just, you know, as you says, we have to, so we have to. Um, and so I felt like the Gorgon immortality should be slightly different from that because they're not lofty Olympian dwellers. They do live on land, but they have 
connections both to the sea and the air. You know, their parents are sea gods and they have wings, they can fly. So they are fully liminal creatures. They live on a shore, they're right by the water, they can fly up in the air. And it's like, well, what, what would be the difference between those gods and an Olympian god? And the answer seemed to me to be that you would be capable, at least if it happened in your existence to be called on to change. And so the, they are kind of horrified by it when they first realize it, that not only is Medusa changing, they, they get her as a baby, and of course she turns into a person, an adult, um, but that they change because they love someone who changes. And, and when, you, when you love somebody who is intrinsically human or fragile or mortal or any of those things, it's, it's, you know, pain is baked in, it hurts as much as it's worth, you know? So they know, I think, from the get go, that in loving her, they will lose her because whatever happens to her, they'll live forever and she won't. And so it was all that tragedy is so inherent to their relationship. I'm really surprised it took me till I started the book to, to work that out. But there you go. <laughs> I go that way sometimes. Well, I think that's it's beautifully said. And, um, you know, the, the, the concept of some characters needing to change versus other ones having no incentive. I thought another element of the immortality, mortality was the vulnerability, um, mm. because obviously, you know, whenever you're taking care of something, especially a baby, one of the first things that dawns on you when you're a new parent is how easy it is for these things to like not make it. <laughs> you know, you have to yes. work really, really, really hard to ensure their survival. So it's absolutely um, how like, awful to be a Gorgon and, and, and have never feared anything. And then to suddenly find that you're afraid of something happening to this tiny sister that you didn't know you had until yesterday. It's like, well, what would that be like? And it's a, again, it's a, an encounter that the sisters have, that Senna and Uriali have, where they have to kind of acknowledge that this is another way in which they've changed, that now they're afraid. They're gorgons. <laughs> they're not afraid of anything. And then suddenly you're afraid for who you love. Why wouldn't you be? Um, is there something else that we can learn from Medusa's experience with regards to the fact that she's mortal? I mean, I think she lives in a really what's the word I want? She lives in it. She's very present, I suppose, which is a bit hideous, but it is true um, that because she is sort of the guardian of memories, because when you have two, when, when the only other people, you know, are two Gorgon sisters who are immortal for them necessarily, the days are all really alike. So their only point of change is her. You know, otherwise it's like, you know, some days the weather is pretty much identical to the other days. And then you, and that sense of sameness. I mean, a lot of us got a, a good go on it when lockdowns were happening, where every single day felt the same. And it became incredibly difficult to know when things had happened. You know, time seemed to be it was like a, a an accordion. It was suddenly a stretch out. It's been months and months and months. And then suddenly it'd be like, oh, no, that feels like yesterday. But it happened five years ago. And so I felt like for them. That, that sense of not being able to ever be kind of tethered in time would be really the only thing they were used to. And so it's Medusa who is there saying, remember when we did this, remember when we did that. She is the guardian of their memories. And actually um, I have an appalling, I have an incredible memory for you know, Greek myth and an appalling memory for my own actual life. Um, so much so that I quite often pay somebody to remind me to do things that otherwise I would forget to do that are, you know, really to, like go to the dentist or something like that. Uh, it's like, I can't, I just, I won't even remember to set an alarm, a reminder or something. And it's like, I'm so, I'm so bad at keeping kind of a close grip on my own existence. And so, yeah, in a way, I think she is a, <laughs> she's a salutary lesson to me more than anything else. I'm just trying to be alive on the day that you're alive instead of, you know, vaguely, you know, detaching from it because there are always other things that you have to think about. And isn't that the truth? I'm very empathetic right. to your plight on that. Very <laughs> empathetic. <laughs> I'm like, what did I even have for breakfast? I have no idea. Mm. Um, <laughs> I can never answer that question. When you go to do a sound check at a venue, that's always the question. And what they want you to say is porridge because they want to hear if the microphone is going to pop with a pop sound. And so I kind of know that. And yet at the same time, I'm like, oh, breakfast, I don't, well, I didn't know there was going to be an exam. That's basically my first response every single time. I'm like, that was so long ago. How can anyone remember what they did five hours ago? 
Well, you can only you can only remember that which you are paying attention to. So you yeah, know, I'm yeah, never it's... paying attention. That's the truth of it. Uh, yeah. My head is always lost in the Bronze Age, and so yeah, I have perfect recall of that. Typical. Uh, okay, let's get to the Bronze Age then. I was sort of reading up a bit more on some of the historical elements of it, and I had seen from Joseph Campbell that there was this theory that the legend of Perseus beheading Medusa was actually a moment in like the 13th century BC when the Hellenes ran over the goddess chief shrines. And I, I hadn't actually seen that, that there was sort of this shift of taking away mm. power for women and that so there was an element of the of the myth that had a, a historical reality I didn't know if that was something you had seen read agreed yeah I, I don't know I don't know is the truth of the matter I'm always really wary of um trying to find history in myth and I do see that's my very modern distinction and you know obviously for the ancient Greeks there is no distinction between history and myth myth is just history that happened a while ago that's why there are still dragons in it and so I get that that's my problem but it is still I'm kind of think I I really like the idea of being able to make that claim but it, it just feels a lot more confident from so little evidence that I I don't, I don't think I could I don't think I could rival that quantity of confidence and I'm troubled as well I think by the the way that you know we'd like we like the idea of gorgons being the sort of uber feminine but actually they're not quite as as feminine as all that i mean our early ones especially look much more like if you were looking for a thing for them to represent the natural world would be a much stronger candidate um you know they have those very very wide mouths with the lolling tongues in the earlier version sixth century and so on <laughs> which implies that the mouth is open, right? Which implies that they can make a noise and Uriali is famed for having this very loud cry. Um, and uh, I, I mean, there've been various attempts to find the, the etymology of Gorgon and the most persuasive, although it's not definite, is to connect them to thunder, the idea of thunder and lightning. So essentially the, the Gorgon Aeon is designed to protect you or, or to give you a solid object, a talisman that, you can think of as the sort of embodiment of your fears and feel safer, but not just for terrifying storms that could easily, you know, set things on fire with a lightning strike on a, a hot Greek day, but also all that wildlife, you know, the snakes for hair, but the mass of hair, whether it has snakes in or not, is very reminiscent of a lion's mane, something big catty. Um, the fact that they have tusks usually, at least tusks coming up from the bottom, set of teeth sometimes also from the top set of teeth again you know it's it's really hard to see those and not think wild boar are being referenced here a lot of those early gorgons also have beards like the bearded pigs which you find sometimes in greek myth so i i think it it i like the idea of it i don't feel confident of it i i feel um i feel that gorgons and gorgonaire in particular are meant to reflect the the natural world and that the perils which face us therein I think that we see Gorgonea in the same way that if you went to Greece or to Turkey today and everywhere you go you would see evil eye stuff um, on jewellery a key ring you know every single thing that you can imagine has the evil eye um, colour scheme in it somewhere and you know do you believe in the evil eye I don't know but you're protected against it anyway hey so I think there's to me Gorgon Gorgon heads seem very much designed to make you it, it's, it's taken me a really long time to accept that I have a very modern attitude to animals, but because of when we are alive and where we are alive, um, it had honestly not occurred to me until really recently that that you would look at animals and sort of automatically assume that they were a danger to you. Because for my whole life, we've been a danger to them. You know, even when I was a small child, we were being told about potential extinction of all kinds of animals. So. I've always felt this sort of terrible guilt towards the natural world. You know, it's like, well, I have to make sure that I don't do anything with, and so on and so on. But of course, if you lived in ancient Greece, the natural world was just full of, it's like being in Australia now. It's just full of things that want you to die. <laughs> so, it's like, oh, well, yes, no, that does make things a little different. And so of course you would want those kinds of talismans. Why not? So is the Gorgon head almost like a composite of fearful things of nature? And so. she sort of flies around. And so then is it the evolution of the myth to make it into something that 
human representative by Perseus can decapitate and then control is like yeah. the, the ancient mythology of just trying to control nature. A manageable monster. Yeah, absolutely. Which will, of course, be the title of my autobiography. Um, but uh, <laughs> Love it. Love it. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I think um, I think that that feels to me a closer thing. Um, you know, the Greeks, however troubling we might find the, the subtext to it, the Greeks do like a story in which a Greek male hero goes out and causes damage in some way or another to a female non-Greek non-hero. Um, and there are lots and lots of myths that cover that territory. Um, and so you have to assume, I mean, it, it, it shows itself in the way people name the, the artworks, the Canova statue of Perseus holding up the head of Medusa in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, a copy in the Vatican Museum in Rome. Um, is called Perseus triumphant and it's like well it's only triumphant if you're on his side <laughs> otherwise it just looks like serial killer holds up trophy to me but I accept that you know that that's a different way of looking at it and so yeah I think it's quite important to at least try to keep this this sense of multiple readings in place you know when Freud saw the story of Perseus and Medusa he saw it as a myth about castration fear it's like mate I, d I don't want to be rude but she's not even a man. <laughs> so how did you manage to get castration out of this? If anything, when you see a sort of massive curling hair or snakes or anything like that in um, stories, then generally we're encouraged to, to connect them with women's pubic hair. So if anything, she is the sort of earth feminine in that regard. And yet still Freud serenely wandering in. This must be about me. It's not about you. <laughs> not everything is about you. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a perfect illustration, I think, of, uh, of the way that what's that great Margaret Atwood line about how men are afraid that women will laugh at them and women are afraid that men will kill them. Um, it seems to me that the story of Medusa is the ultimate fear of the female gaze, that if she's looking at you, she can hurt you. And what's the only way you can change that by killing her well what happens then well then she can still kill but you get to decide who she kills so it's all about weaponizing women's bodies and and utilizing them for your own nefarious ends in the case of perseus he kind of does become a bit more like a god um, yeah <laughs> it in in is it strange though that she only turns men into stone um she doesn't turn anyone into stone while she's alive I would point out. I've never really understood why she gets this reputation of being a terrifying monster, except for the fact that we're all obsessed with women being terrifying monsters. Um, but yeah, certainly not in my version and not in any narrative version that I can think of offhand, although I'm you know, always happy to hear another. Um, she doesn't kill, I mean, she does in modern versions, in, the, in Clash of the Titans, she kills a man. Um, by sort of slithering forwards on her snaky tail, her eyes flash, and but she's already shot him with a, an arrow. So yeah, she she gives him a really good good double whammy of injuries. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a source of some interest to me that Medusa is presented to us as this terrifying monster who'll turn you to stone. Well, who does she turn to stone? Well, she turns all these people to, sorry, at that point, she's a decapitated head. Perseus <laughs> yes. turns them to stone. You know, he's the one who makes the choice. And so it, it has, it's, it's always seemed weird to me, even when I was writing her chapter in Pandora's Jar, I was like, what, wait, what? And I was hunting and hunting around for sources where, you know, there was anything about Medusa kind of rampaging through the countryside of Northern Libya <laughs> <laughs> and turning people to stone. And you'd turn up somewhere in some temple and literally every single statue had previously been a free human being. No, it doesn't happen. Um, so yeah, I, I was a bit, I was a bit surprised and it was one of those times when you think god i would have thought i was right at the front of people paying attention to this sort of thing and i hadn't noticed that you know she just, she just doesn't seem by by her own volition responsible for anyone's death it, it's all on perseus that is amazing i had not realized that too i mean here i was thinking of you know that scene in narnia or something you get a whole garden right. full of statues and so how did right. they even know she could turn people into stone if she never turned anyone to stone i mean just your guess is as good as mine I, guess, I know well, how Perseus knows in my version, um, because there's a conversation when he's told, which I very much enjoyed writing, um, because he's sort of just about decided that maybe this impossible quest isn't going to be impossible at all. Now he's had help from like 98 different gods. And then suddenly someone reveals to him um, that there's just this one tiny little 
thing that they, they oh, slightly forgotten to mention. <laughs> it's just like absolutely devastating. So yeah, I very much enjoyed writing that. Um, now you've mentioned quite a few different sources, but what were some mm. of the sort of unsurprising or the surprising sources that you found like really relevant for the book? The most surprising thing by far was how few literary sources there were, because I set out to write it feeling so confident, having done a thousand ships. It's like, I totally know how to do this. I hunt down all my sources. I choose the bit of the story that I like the most and ta-da! And then with this one, I'm like, okay, I've got four pages and now anyone? <laughs> so, you know, there's like a sentence here or there in Pindar or Hesiod. There's a, there's a longer version in Ovid, but it's focused very much on Perseus. Um, and so, you know, there are small mentions of her in Pseudopolydorus or whatever. And actually it means that by far the majority of the sources for this book for me was artwork, visual artwork. So um, vase paintings, that incredible Hydra in the Met in New York, there's an equally extraordinary vase painting showing the aftermath of the decapitation in the British Museum in London. Um, the enormous war between the gods and the giants, the Gigantomachy, um, is almost entirely written from the Pergamon altar in Berlin. <laughs> so, um, and when I embarked on that chapter, Britain had just left the EU, like finally, finally, um, and everything was locked down for COVID. Um, and so it was, I thought, well, I'm never gonna be able to get over there to, to see it. You know, Germany was locked down, Britain was locked down where I am. Um, and then I tracked down this, this book of photographs of the Pergamon altar, a German book, and I don't speak German because I took Greek instead. Uh, it's worked out all right. Um, and uh, and I, I ordered it from them thinking, oh, it'll never get here. You know, their museums are shut because there's lockdown and we've just severed all our trading relationships. So I'll never turn up. And when it does, the tax, import tax will be like 10 million pounds. Three days later, boom, straight there. I was like, Germans are great. <laughs> They're just great. So yeah, it was, it was a constant, um, negotiation around visual arts and the the book concludes I don't want to spoil it the book concludes with uh, an image which is entirely taken um, from a piece of visual art and there's a there's a point four fifths of the way through the book where um, a, a piece of art isn't made in my book um, and so I create the piece of art that doesn't exist that sounds really insane but that's that's how it was written um, and it's based on a piece of art that does exist but in a different form I think I'll just leave that to your future readers to figure out uh, where they're yeah, going to find so. that it's a little easter egg thrown out for them um okay, well, my you, books are always full of easter eggs I'm the absolute worst person I, I do them every single time I can never resist so yeah if you're looking for them they're always there I think that's perfect because then people can enjoy it on several levels. And I know for I people so. who spend a lot of time in the mythology world, um, you know, they, they obviously there it's it's sort of like the Greek experience because you know what's going to happen. I mean, <laughs> there's yeah. there's no full spoilers because you you know the arc of the story, so it's it's good to um, have the suspense built and know what's going to what the characters are thinking as they go along. Uh, yeah, but. Yeah. It, I wanted to say, you know, you've been always so generous with your time. So I do want to ask one last question because you are so prolific and you've always got so many projects going on. What's the next one that we should be waiting for? Oh, the next thing you'll see is oh, I'll do series nine of the radio series next summer. So that's Natalie Haynes stands up for the classics, which in the UK you get on BBC Radio 4 and everywhere else in the world you get on BBC Sounds or Audible or wherever you want to. Um, so that will be series nine that I make next year. And I'm currently writing the sequel to Pandora's Jar. So another nonfiction book on this time goddesses in Greek myth. So I'm just writing about Artemis at the moment. Um, and that will come out in the UK in October 23. And I think you guys will probably get it a few months later. And I have to put this on record because I get told off about it all the time. I'm so sorry there's a delay between when the books come out in the UK and when the books come out in the US. And the reason is that it took like nearly two years to persuade anyone to buy um, a thousand ships. So it was just a really long, slow process. It came out, I can't remember, about 20 months later in the US than it came out in the UK. And so my American publishers are working so hard to try and squish the gap down, um, which, and they're, they're doing an incredible job, which is why Stoneblind is only coming out like five months later, having been 20 months behind two books ago. So we are getting there. We can't go any faster. I'm really sorry. 
Well, I see people are, are buying them from the UK. So they're they're getting for those who are really interested. And you can get the Kindle now or for I don't know. I would think so. Um, I, if you can, I don't know what the word is, to like de-regionalize, uh, you can probably get it. The audio book and the um, real world book, um, I think will only both become available in the US in February, beginning of February of, of 23. So yeah, you guys can't hear the audio book yet either, I'm afraid, which is a shame because I do it. And if you think I didn't give my all to the Chatterbox Crow, you are a fool to yourself. There's a whole chapter in a Chatterbox Crow's voice. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to that. Thank you so <laughs> much. I'll leave all the links below and uh, let everyone enjoy the book themselves. Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds.